start the recording. You now all got that. And I'm going to go with the live stream here in theory. Well, I may have to upload it is what I'm being told. You're not enabled. Okay, so we're going to upload the recording because apparently I don't have a button fixed there. Go ahead. Um, and on behalf of the Augustan Society, welcome to this presentation by Stephen DeCassian. Um, what is interesting about the Augustan Society is we're a small organization that is uh, promoting heritage, uh, history, genealogy, heraldry, royalty and nobility, and chivalry. And what has been one of my object objectives, I'm the president, uh, uh, talking to you from a little tiny town in the far part of Washington state, as I say, out in the wilderness, um, is that the use of social media and technology has allowed us to bring folks together from across the globe. Uh, we have folks here across the United States as well as into France. And uh, that's that's an awesome opportunity uh, for us to share and in, engage in the passion of history. And social media also connected Stephen DeCassian and myself in a real strange way um, on X and Twitter, where we st he was sharing some things about Rostra and ancient uh, naval rams. And uh, you can't see it, but I'm wearing a, a um, T-shirt that has uh, the story of Dionysus and the Thracian pirates uh, on a boat that had features one of those type of uh, rams. And it's been fun over the last few years uh, watching Stephen's uh, graduate career and study grow uh, to the point to where he is probably the first person that you will meet digital, uh, digitally or in person that has actually cast a Roman, a, a, an ancient naval ram. I shouldn't just say Roman. I should say ancient naval, and Stephen will correct that. I'm going to let Stephen drive here the presentation and make him the host. And then we will, this is being recorded, as you saw, we will upload this to YouTube so folks can then watch it down the, uh, on our Augustan Society uh, YouTube channel. There's an Instagram page we have, as well as a general Facebook page, if you're interested in learning more. And then um, what we usually do is with these presentations, we send a note out to folks that we do another on another topic by an email inviting you to join those again free made possible by a member of the society to do this so with that i'm going to make you the host Stephen. and again welcome uh to everybody and uh good morning texas thank you thank you very much let me share my screen Can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay. So uh, first off, I just wanna thank the Augustan Society and Rod Fleck for hosting today's lecture. Uh, I'm excited to present to you um, my lecture entitled From Beeswax to Bronze, Experimental Archeology span and Archeological Evidence for Ancient Naval Rams. So just a quick introduction of who I am, even though Rod kind of covered it. Uh, I am a PhD candidate at Texas A&M University, and I study nautical archaeology. Uh, nautical archaeology is the study of the remains of boats and ships, and also the cultures that created and used them. Uh, I received my MA in ancient history from the University of South Florida as well. My main academic interests uh, are Greek and Roman maritime history and archaeology, with, of course, a special focus on naval warfare, naval rams, and warships. Uh, I have studied and participated in projects in both Greece and Italy. Uh, these include archaeological and historical projects concerning naval warfare and, of course, naval rams. <clears throat> now, the pictures you see on the left uh, were part of my dissertation research in which I created a full-scale three-bladed waterline ram using ancient methods. And the top picture, of course, is me in the center, uh, and then my two, uh, I guess, co-project leads, Dr. Christopher Dostal and Glenn Greco, who work at Texas A&M University. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, so today's lecture will follow a simple agenda. Uh, first, we will take a look. Uh, first, I will take us through the complex history of naval ram development that spans almost 1,000 years, or a little over 1,000 years, depending on how you think about it. In this section, I will talk about how the ram change over time, in accordance with shipbuilding techniques, bronze casting methods, and naval warfare tactics. Uh, I will also elaborate as to why I chose to place RAM development into certain categories based on these ideas. Uh, next, I will talk about the archaeological evidence for naval RAMs. This includes various types of RAMs, from three-bladed waterline RAMs to so-called proto-RAMs. Uh, the RAMs that will be discussed come from numerous sites across the Mediterranean, with the most well-known evidence for RAMs coming from the Egedi battle site in western Sicily, and of course, from the Actium Victory Monument in Greece. Uh, I will then take uh, you through the steps of my experimental archaeological project, which I said successfully cast the first full-scale naval ram uh, in over 1,500 years using ancient methods, hence the name of today's lecture, From Beeswax to Bronze. And then at the end, we will wrap up with lessons learned uh, from the project uh, and future research based on my experimental archaeological project, and then a sh short Q&A. So to start off, you know, a lot of people don't know what is a naval ram. What am I exactly talking about? Uh, so like I said, my main research concerns the naval ram, an ancient naval weapon. Uh, in essence, a naval ram was a penetrating weapon placed at the bow of an ancient warship near the waterline. Rams were used in both offensive and defensive naval maneuvers to strike, or ram other warships that could that could cause damage uh, that could lead to an enemy ship being either sunk, swamped, or completely destroyed. Uh, the ram likely developed from an extension of the timbers that made up the bow of a warship. Right, this combination of this protrusion, sometimes called a forefoot or a cutwater, and a bronze covering, became the basis for naval rams in antiquity. So by the mid sixth to early fifth centuries BCE. Uh, the ram had developed into its so-called final form, which we refer to in modern terms as the three-bladed waterline ram, uh, which you see pictured here, two from Egedi and one from the Piraeus Museum in Athens. Three-bladed waterline rams are characterized by their three-finned profiles that were used to split and puncture enemy warship holes that were held together by pegged mortise and tenon joinery. Eventually, three-bladed waterline rams, like those built during the Hellenistic and later, later Roman Republican periods, uh, were used to break through harbor siege defenses, especially in the Hellenistic East, and even ram warships head-on, uh, where they would strike the frontal face of a warship or directly ram to ram. So when looking at rams in my studies, I always came back to this central question. How do we get from early cutwaters like the warships depicted on geometric bases on the left that have no ram, two large three-bladed waterline rams on ancient warships, kind of like the ram placed on the modern-day reconstructed trireum, the Olympias. Uh, the, the answer, as you're about to see and hear, is quite complex. Uh, I attempted to answer this question three years ago in the first lecture I gave to the Augustan Society, uh, but my views have changed slightly, uh, and obviously there is now more evidence uh, for the development and history of the naval ram, even within these past few years. So again, the main question that I'm trying to answer with the history of development of the ram is how do we get from these early cutwaters to these large three-bladed waterline rams? So after years of reading and reading, I came up with my own interpretation of naval ram development that some might find agreeable, uh, others may not. Of course, my interpretation uh, cannot cover every single aspect in detail, uh, though I wish it could. However, based on a close examination of the textual, iconographic, and archaeological evidence, uh, as well as my experimental uh, project, uh, I came up with this evolutionary history of the ram. Now, a lot of this evidence spans from the 10th century BCE to the 6th century CE. So, I'm, I'm taking a lot of evidence and trying to, uh, you know, stitch together um, a development, a developmental history for uh, a weapon that goes through a lot of changes, a lot of overlap, technological regression. Uh, so this is not a perfect del developmental timeline, uh, but it's something that might help people understand 
how the RAM worked in antiquity. Uh, but in essence, RAMs stem from the earliest bow projections in the Mediterranean, like warships that had spurs, four feet, and cutwaters, right? These warships, warship builds are the prerequisites to ramming vessels. So cutwaters be, uh, on warships come before warships with rams. But once we get to the 8th century BCE, iconographic evidence appears and shows what I call proto-rams, right? Proto-rams are the first rams to be placed on warships. Um, these include bronze coverings, solid cast bronze coverings, and boar's head rams. In the 6th century BCE, rams and ramming become more important in the Mediterranean and more important in naval warfare. And they spur on a ram development into two distinct paths, uh, one of more generalized or lesser bronze rams, and another path which I like to call chisel ram. Uh, and then into the 5th century BCE, stemming from the chisel ram line, the three-bladed waterline ram is invented and reigns as the dominant naval weapon for almost 1,000 years. However, even though its general design, right, the three blades would stay the same, its size, its shape, and tactics employing the three-bladed waterline ram would differ greatly through different periods, in different locations, and of course, across different cultures. So I'm going to try to walk you through this, uh, not in too much in depth, but walk you through each of these categories. So again, like I said, the first thing that comes before a ramming vessel is bow projections, right? In short, a bow projection is a longitudinal extension of the hull at or just below the waterline. Bow projections include spurs, four feet, and cutwaters. Bow projections comprise forward protrusions, uh, forward protruding timbers at the bow's waterline that strengthen the vertical stem and allow for a finer bow increasing the vessel's speed, right? It makes it more hydrodynamic. Uh, that's arguable, but usually we uh, uh, scholars agree that uh, a cutwater makes a warship more hydrodynamic. Uh, while bow projections may resemble waterline rams, right? The picture in the bottom left may look like a ram. Um, it likely is not a ram and these bow projections did not function as ramming weapons. Uh, however, warships with bow projections did precede ram bearing or ramming vessels, right? So these bow projections date before the 10th century BC, of course, in the Mediterranean, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. But the ones I look at specifically date from the, 8th, uh, the 10th to 8th century BCE, specifically uh, geometric pottery pieces. Uh, the warfare that these warships are included in uh, is coastal raiding and boarding mostly. Uh, so a lot of these warships are used to uh, raid coastal cities, right? Reaching your ship onto the shore and then back in water uh, or boarding another ship purposely. Uh, the shipbuilding processes that are used to build a ship is likely lace construction. We have no actual archaeological evidence for these warships at this time. And of course, there's no casting method used because no ram exists on these types of warships. Uh, moving forward, proto-rams. Uh, like I said, proto-rams were ram-like projections at a warship's bow. These included bronze coverings, sheathing, oars head rams, and various ram-like structures lacking a strong vertical ramming head or three blades. Um, Proto-rams were used on warships to ram other vessels in both defensive and offensive naval maneuvers. So these proto-rams, again, with some overlap between bow projections and the next class, date between the 8th to 6th centuries BCE. Uh, they're involved first probably or likely in defensive warfare, where warships engaging in boarding tactics uh, likely hit one another, and one another in the bow or in the cutwater, and they tried to find a way to uh, shore up these uh, weak joints by putting bronze castings over them or bronze coverings. And then later they became tougher uh, and were involved in actual purposeful offensive ramming. The shipbuilding that is used during this period uh, is first laced, which does not make a good ramming vessel, and then mixed construction, which involves mortise and tenon joinery and lace construction, which again doesn't make the greatest ramming vessel, but probably makes offensive ramming possible. Uh, and then in terms of casting during this period, uh, we do have evidence for uh, the hammering technique and also lost wax cast, which is the most important for building bronze naval rams to a large extent. 
The next category uh, is the chisel ram, which I believe is the missing developmental link from the boar's head ram to the three-bladed waterline ram. The chisel ram was a transitional design that was formed like a large bronze wedge or ax head encasing bigger bow timbers than its boar's head ram predecessor. Right. In contrast to the three-bladed waterline ram, which we'll discuss, the chisel ram lacked the thin, the three-fin profile, right? There's three blades. However, it had a central vertical ramming head around a bronze core, which was used to break through the hulls of enemy warships. So this chisel ram period um, is highly debatable because it comes between the proto-rams, the boar's head, and the three-bladed waterline rams. But in the iconographic evidence, we actually do see a lot of these uh, chisel rams appear. They appear on coins, on pottery pieces, uh, et cetera, during this period between the 6th and 5th centuries BCE. So something with rams is happening, a transitional period is happening very fast um, during the 6th and 5th centuries BCE. And so, so is warfare in terms of ramming. We have uh, <coughs> ramming to maneuver uh, tactics and also boarding uh, or ramming to board tactics. Again, shipbuilding during this time period is mostly based on merchant wrecks, uh, mixed construction, mortise and tenon, and lacing construction, uh, peg mortise and tenon come a little bit later. Uh, and then casting during this period, we do have evidence of lost wax casting where we have solid pieces that are very complex. So this is now a period from which we can have large cast bronzes that are capable of uh, giving a great punch to another warship. And then moving forward, three-bladed waterline rams, right? Warships with three-bladed waterline rams are described and depicted in ancient sources, uh, typically uh, from a side view with a bronze three-bladed projection attached to the belt at or below the waterline. The presence of warships with three-bladed waterline rams attached at their bows indicates the pinnacle of ram development until its abandonment in late antiquity. Even though the three-bladed design was used widely, uh, it didn't have extensive and immediate acceptance as some scholars have argued, right? We have boar's head rams, chisel rams. We do have three-bladed waterline rams, but it's not, uh, I think Lionel Cassie said that once the three-bladed waterline ram was invented, everyone had it. I, I disagree with that. We have an overlap between chisel rams and three-bladed waterline rams. We have an overlap of generalized bronze rams, boar's head rams. It's not once this ram comes onto the scene, everyone has to have it. Uh, weapon development takes time. It takes, uh, you know, trial and error over many periods um, and battle, you know, and, takes battles for battles to happen for these weapons to be tested. Uh, so in terms of three-bladed waterline rams, uh, they can actually be likely divided into four subcategories uh, and then one subsidiary category known as proembolia. Uh, so these types or these four subcategories um, include the prefrontal ramming type, the frontal ramming type, the large form type, and prestige type three-bladed waterline rams. Again, each one of these is of the basic three-bladed fin design, but their size, construction, tactile view, and overall purpose in naval warfare differed greatly, right? Prefrontal rams are smaller three-bladed waterline rams used before uh, 413 BCE. They were probably lightly cast, not as big. We have might have some evidence of these rams in the archaeological record. Frontal ramming type rams are like the athlete ram, right? These large type rams. And then large form rams uh, would be like the ones we see on the Actium Monument, right? Massive rams or the Arch of Orange pictured here. Uh, these three-bladed waterline rams in general, all of them date from the 5th century BCE to 6th century CE. So three-bladed waterline rams in the historical record last for almost a thousand years. Uh, the last mention of three-bladed waterline rams in a naval battle is by the historian Procopius in the 500s. Uh, that's arguable. Uh, he might be using classical terminology to discuss uh, naval battles, but that is the last known reference to them. Uh, in terms of warfare, these three-bladed waterline rams are used in all types of warfare, maneuvering to ram, frontal ramming, uh, naval siege warfare. And then also rams are built so large that they're actually useless for warfare. Uh, this happens during the Hellenistic period uh, when some warships are built so large and rams so large that they cannot move from their harbor, they cannot actually participate in ramming warfare. They're more like showpieces. 
Uh, and these ships are built using pegged mortise and tendon joinery. Uh, we don't really have that much evidence for these warships. Again, archaeological evidence for the, the entire warship. We do have some rams. Um, but the rams we have, some of them do have bow timbers in them that hint at the construction using pegged mortise and tendon joinery. And then, of course, the rams that we do have in the archaeological record uh, do show that they were built in the direct lost wife casting method. Okay, folks, I'm going to just interject real quick. If mm -hmm. we can put everybody on mute, uh, we've had a few odd noises in the background. And so I just want to remind everybody to put yourself on mute. That'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, so moving forward, uh, we have Proembolia or subsidiary rams. Um, Proembolia uh, were subsidiary rams that were attached to a higher portion of a warship's bow and acted as a supporting ram to the main ram that rests at the waterline. Right, their purpose was to prevent entanglement with an uh, opposing vessel during a ramming attack, as well as cause damage to an enemy vessel. Uh, in some cases, proembolia served a strictly ornamental purpose. The Greek word proembolia can be translated to mean forward projection or fore ram or upper ram, uh, depends on how you want to translate it. Uh, in iconographic depictions, proembolia can be seen as box shape, uh, animal heads, you know, crocodiles, lions, things like that, boar's heads even. Uh, and then real three-bladed waterline rams or actual three-bladed waterline rams typically look like the three-bladed design of a waterline ram. Uh, proembolia have a similar historical development to the main waterline ram, but tend to not be as widely used as the primary ram. So again, pretty much the same information for three-bladed waterline rams. They date from the 5th century BCE to the 6th century CE. We do have a, a mosaic. I believe it dates to the 4th century CE that depicts warships with proembolia. And I think that might be the actual uh, last depiction of them or the latest depiction of them. Uh, and then in warfare, again, maneuvering to ram, frontal ramming, naval siege warfare. This all comes from the textual sources. Shipbuilding, we can assume it's pegged more than 10 and joinery based on the other ships. Uh, then casting from one prone bully that we have or one known prone bully that we have it was likely to direct loss by casting method. And then lastly, uh, lesser bronze rams. Uh, this category, and I've written this part in my dissertation, uh, is the most complex because even though, uh, you know, the three bladed waterline ram exists in its many different forms and shapes, there are definitely warships of a smaller size that have bronze rams on them. Um, I couldn't cover this as much in my dissertation, so I think that this calls for more scholars to look at it, but lesser bronze rams um, refer to any style of ram that is not of the chisel or three-bladed design, but existed concurrently with each in historical and military context. So examples of lesser bronze rams uh, would include likely iconograph iconographic representations of Valyrian stern rams. I'm not really sure if those existed, but some have made the argument. Uh, but we do have an archaeologically attested ram that came from the Black Sea uh, called the Mithridatic ram, which is probably a bronze covering, and it dates to the time when the three-bladed waterline ram was the main ram used, uh, but it was used on a smaller vessel, this Mithridatic ram. So rams in the lesser bronze category were built in bronze to protect the cut water or the forward timbers of a warship and likely used in fighting smaller and lighter vessels, right, during a time period when the three-bladed waterline ram was used. So these, again, date to a similar period from the 6th century BCE to 6th century CE. Again, warfare varies, shipbuilding varies, casting varies because these rams, we don't have that much evidence for them. We have some iconographic depictions. Uh, some people say that the iconographic depictions use cutwaters, not rams, right? These arguments happen every day, but I would say that lesser bronze rams during this period when the three-bladed waterline ram is the pinnacle ram include smaller rams like bronze encasings used on smaller warships, riverine rams, likely small patrol boats might have a bronze encasing, maybe not a ram necessarily for ramming purposes, and then this elusive stern ram, which may or may not exist. So that's the, an overview of naval ram development, um, which 
uh, I've tried to get at in my dissertation. But in general, uh, rams are extremely popular in Greek and Roman cultures. I just want to talk about this for uh, a second. Uh, so in political and victory monuments and displays in museums, we had over 100 um, monuments, displays, and museums attested in the textual sources and archaeological um, evidence that discuss rams in these places, right? Victory monuments, setting up rams as displays of victory, setting full warships in ancient museums for people and come look at it, uh, setting up rams um, in uh, temples, right, dedicated to the gods for victory. We do have rams in funerary contexts, right? Marble rams dedicated uh, to show that the deceased was a an admiral or won a naval victory. We do have, find rams in entertainment. Uh, there was likely a ancient Greek game that involved something like a naval battle and ramming uh, one another in the game itself. Again, we see rams in entertainment in Naumachia, right, which is Roman uh, mock naval battles. We might not have actual ramming, but the act of ramming probably did occur in these battles. Uh, we see rams in commerce and trade. There's tons of uh, coins, numismatic evidence, that shows rams on coins. We see rams in political and military fashion in attire, right? There's the Corona Rostrata, which is a um, like a, a victory crown given to uh, a Roman general, specifically Agrippa, uh, after his naval victories that has like a little ram on the top um, to display his naval prowess. Uh, we see rams in common and household items, right? Rams as part of little rita, which are cups, drinking cups, or for pouring libations. We see rams as part of uh, spouts, right? For water spouts, for watering things. So there's a little ram at the end, so you can pour it out and the water comes out the ram. Uh, rams are also used in ancient textual sources uh, and in some marble reliefs as sexual innuendos and objects. So in some Greek plays, rams are used as jokes um, uh, to relate to the phallus, right? There's a joke in one Greek play about an old man getting an erection that is better than three naval rams. Uh, and then lastly, rams are used in textual sources to describe areas, right? So uh, I believe it's uh, Herodotus is one case where he describes an area looking like the front of a warship and the one uh, island jutting out like a naval ram. So that's just part of how popular these rams are and helps us understand uh, just how central they are to Greek and Roman cultures. But what about actual concrete evidence, right? What is the archeological evidence for naval rams? Uh, so the pictures on the left here, on uh, the top right is the Philonica ram in Pisa, a uh, very interesting ram. Uh, the bottom right is the Canepolis ram in Athens. It may or may not be an actual ram, could be what I call a proto-ram, uh, but its context is not good. We don't know exactly where it was found. Dating is difficult, so that's up for uh, interpretation. And then the left picture is the Bremerhaven ram. So I tried to make a little map for everyone. Uh, where do we find naval rams? So we actually find them across the Mediterranean and into the Black Sea, and then uh, up into Central Europe. So the blue is the actual fine spot uh, of these rams, and then the red spot is the Bremerhaven ram, which actually lacks a clear fine location or fine spot. So we have the Bremerhaven ram in north, the Bon Proambolian, which is found in the Rhine River, and then moving down, we have rams that are found in northern Italy, and then right, the Egedi rams in western Sicily, the Aquadroni ram, which is a very important ram uh, in eastern Sicily, and then of course the scatter of rams in Greece, dating to a wide uh, period. We have the Belgamo Prombolian in Libya, the Athet ram in Israel, and then of course that elusive uh, Mithridatic ram in the Black Sea. So in terms of archeological evidence, more than 39 rams or ram-like artifacts exist in the archeological record. That depends on your definition of what constitutes a ram and ram-like artifact. Uh, I've made this argument in my dissertation about how to define a ram and what can, constitutes a ram. So in my account, I would say there are 39 rams or ram-like artifacts. 
most of these ram-like artifacts are of the three-bladed design, which you see pictured here at the top, which is the athlete ram. The athlete ram was the first three-bladed waterline ram to be discovered off the coast of athlete Israel in the 1980s. Um, many of the rams that we have uh, in the archaeological record have been discovered actually on the sea floor. So of the 39 rams in the archaeological record, 27 were recovered at the Egedi Island site in western Sicily. Ooh, sorry. Um, other notable discoveries include, right, Apodronia, I said that, Bremerhaven, Polonica, the Piraeus rams, um, and then the Mithridatic ram. We also have Belgamo, Canepolis, Turin, and there is the additional unpublished Imperial Roman Proembolia that has also been found. So again, total of 39 ram-like artifacts, many from the Egedi battle site, and then there's also secondary evidence for rams present at the Actium Victory Monument in Greece. So concerning the Battle of the Egedi Islands and where we find these 27 rams. So prior to the naval battle uh, at Egedi in 241 BCE, uh, the Romans had been engaged in a major conflict, the First Punic War, with their Carthaginian neighbors. Right? This war lasted from 264 to 241 BCE. Unlike the Roman land forces that had some success in defeating the Carthaginians, the Roman naval forces were handed defeat after defeat by the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians were or did have naval superiority over the Romans for most of the First Punic War. Uh, the Romans had nearly given up an attempt to best their enemy at sea. However, near the end of the war, they decided to build a new fleet of 200 quinquereams to try to defeat the Carthaginians one last time. Uh, according to the ancient historian Polybius, the Senate lacked the public funds to produce this new fleet, and so the richest members of Roman society funded a quinquereme each with the promise of reimbursement once the war was won. So as described by the ancient historian Polybius and partly by Diodorus, by 242 BCE, a new Roman fleet of 200 quinquereams was manned and ready to sail. They actually engaged with the Carthaginians in a uh, equal fleet. So the Carthaginians likely had around the same number of ships. So according to Polybius, um, on March 10th, 241 BCE, the two fleets met and engaged in the battle off the Egedi Islands. Polybius states that the Romans fell into line of breast formation, ships right next to each other, um, facing prow out, right, or prow opposed to the enemy ships. Polybius tells us that the battle um, uh, was, I guess, the Carthaginians actually were disadvantaged, um, according to Polybius. But Diodorus says that the uh, it was hotly contested on both sides. So Diodorus is not so much, uh, the ancient story in Diodorus is not very helpful in describing the battle, whereas Polybius is saying that the Carthaginians were definitely disadvantaged. Uh, but in the end, the Romans lost a total of 80 warships, of which 30 were sunk and 50 were damaged. The Carthaginians lost a total of 120 ships, of which 50 were sunk and 70 were damaged or captured by the Romans. Uh, according to Polybius, it was a miraculous victory for the Romans, which resulted in the Carthaginians uh, suing for peace, ending the First Punic War. So that's the Battle of the Egedi Islands of 241 BCE. So now we have the Egedi Battle site. So 2,000 years later, right, or 2,000 plus years later. So the Sopra Intendenza della Mare, RPM Nautical Foundation, and the Society for the Documentation of Submerged Sites has been conducting underwater archaeological surveys in the supposed battle zone of the Egedi Islands since 2005. Right, Their surveys of this battle zone have uncovered multiple artifacts from the battle between Rome and Carthage, particularly amphoras, helmets, and naval rams. Uh, to, to date, right, today, as of today, they have discovered approximately 27 naval rams, both Roman and Carthaginian. Right? And that's that's wild to think about. We only have 39 uh, rams and ram-like artifacts spread across the Mediterranean as evidence for all Mediterranean naval battles. But at this one particular site, um, we have found 27 naval rams, three-bladed waterline rams. Right? The Aegean site is very important uh, for three reasons. Um, it's the only known ancient battlefield discovered. Right, We know that 
we can say for certain or almost certainty that this is the Battle of the Agadir Islands described by Polybius, right? Based on the evidence, based on what we see uh, on the sea floor, we can almost say with 100% certainty, 99% certainty that this is the Battle of the Agadir Islands. Uh, this is the largest number of naval rams found in C2, right? Usually we find rams washed up on shore or they're donated out of context. These rams come straight from the sea floor. Uh, and also, this is one of the longest underwater archaeological projects uh, conducted um, continuously anywhere in the Mediterranean. Uh, I've been a member of RPM Nautical Foundation since 2019, uh, and I've been lucky enough to join them in their efforts to record and preserve these artifacts, especially the naval rams. Uh, so th this includes, or my job includes for RPM, uh, taking the dimensions and descriptions of these rams, the weights, photography, uh, illustrations sometimes, uh, and then mostly 3D modeling, uh, which has been really fun, 3D modeling these rams using the Artec Leo 3D scanner. So the other most important site for naval rams in antiquity is the Actium Victory Monument. So on, on September 2nd, 31 BCE, the combined fleets of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra faced off against the fleet of Octavian to decide the fate of the Roman Republic. Right? The naval battle that ensued was a resounding victory for Octavian, which helped him to establish his dominance over the Roman world. So following the Battle of Actium, Octavian founded a new city called Nicopolis across from the ancient town of Actium. At Octavian's newly established city of Nicopolis, he constructed two naval monuments, one massive and more elaborate than the first. Uh, Octavian used the captured warships from uh, Antony and Cleopatra's fleet to supply his new monument with a variety of naval spoils. The a monument, the exact location of the monument, was erected where Octavian held his command post or tent before the battle on the hilltop overlooking Cape Actium. So on this monument, on the lower retaining wall, um, was attached a line of sockets which rams were placed inside of them. Uh, these rams would have come from Polyrene warships, ranging in classification from a 5 to a 10. So massive warships, uh, some of the largest warships built in antiquity. Based on certain calculations and reconstructions, uh, the largest ram on the monument is said to have weighed over 2 tons of bronze. Right, that's, that's, that's huge. It's a lot of bronze. Uh, although none of these rams have survived, right, evidence of their existence is provided by those rock cuttings in the sockets. So, right, why is this important? Right, last summer, uh, Dr. William Murray uh, requested my assistance to re-examine and measure the entire monument using 3D scanning methods. Um, Dr. Murray has studied this monument and the naval ram sockets for the past 45 years, uh, which has resulted in numerous publications. Uh, and anyone interested in this monument or naval warfare should probably read some of his books because they are uh, seminal in understanding ancient naval warfare. But why is this monument so important to the study of ancient rams when no rams are actually left, right? There's no, no bronze here. So at the campsite monument, right, we said Octavian displayed the captured rams of Anthony and Cleopatra's fleet. The sockets, right, there's at least 33 to 35 sockets or partial sockets. They display at least um, a range of warships, right? These pylorene warships, warships bigger than a trireme classified from a 5 to a 10, right? They might show bigger classes of warships, maybe from 8s to 10s. Uh, the smaller sockets are harder to distinguish from one another, right? So although none of the rams have survived, uh, their existence is evidenced by the rock cuttings. These sockets, right, indicate the possible range and sizes of the largest rams built in antiquity. The sockets offer the best evidence for the back and whale pockets of at least 30 three to 35 large form rams. Uh, these profiles help to indicate that each ram on the monument had an asymmetrical back and pair of whale pockets. This indicates that no two rams were identical in antiquity, even within the same warship class. So even though warships are built for the same class of warship, they are not the same size ram. Uh, this is indirect evidence that each ram must have been cast in the indoor, or sorry, each ram must have been cast in the direct lost wax casting method with the bow of the ship as the core, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, this also shows uh, that no two sockets are similar in size or shape. 
and that no so socket is symmetrical throughout. Again, giving this asymmetry to rams, how difficult it is to actually build ancient warships in rams is evidenced by these sockets. Uh, there was one, a uh, few pieces of bronze actually found at the monument. Uh, one large piece called the Actium Ram Fragment uh, was discovered during the excavations of the monument. Uh, and it kind of hints at the complexity of building these larger rams. It does have wax working marks uh, and things like that. And I was able to examine it last summer. So that's the history of naval ram development, archaeological evidence. And now what can we learn from experimental archaeology? So during my dissertation research, and as Rod said, during the last few years, I conducted an experimental archaeological project to actually reconstruct a uh, a bronze ram using ancient methods starting from scratch um, right this project took around two years from drawing to actually casting the ram so as you see on the left that's just some of the stages of the project so how are naval rams made we know based on ancient sources that naval rams were involved right wood right parts of the ship beeswax Right, that's the material used to make uh, the model, pitch or various pine resins, bronze and stone tools, bronze for casting, refractory clay for the casting, and obviously lots of manpower. And then the casting method used uh, is a matter of debate, uh, not so much anymore, especially after the discovery of more rams and then after this project, I, I'm pretty sure we, we know. Uh, but sand casting was first uh, proposed for all for how uh, all rams were made in antiquity, it's unlikely. We don't have evidence for large sand casting in antiquity. Uh, and then indirect lost wax casting uh, is possible. But again, when we get to larger uh, rams, it's unlikely that indirect lost wax casting is used, right? Indirect lost wax casting is when a model is made of wood, clay, or any other material. And then a multi-part mold is then built around the model. Uh, and then once the model is dry, it is open to release the model. The model is then reassembled and filled with wax to create an exact, an exact replica of the initial model. Uh, and then this secondary model turned, termed the internal model is then invested in cast, right? That's the indirect boss wax casting method. But rams, uh, based on the archeological record, were likely cast in the direct loss wax casting method where one model is built um, around the central or bow timbers of the warship and then cast in bronze. So you get one go at it. You get one model, one cast, and if you fail, you have to start all over again. There is no secondary model. There's no uh, internal model to make another, another model from. So it's actually really difficult to create these things. So my project, the Ancient Naval Ram Casting Project, uh, the purpose of the project was to understand how ancient naval rams were casted and created. Right. So while it is known that the ancients used the lost wax casting method to produce large bronze objects, uh, the intricate details of this process as it relates to ram production is debatable. And we don't really understand or understood how each step worked or what was actually involved. So based on the information, uh, ancient textual sources and everything like that, uh, I decided to recreate the process through three steps. Right. False bow construction, creating the front of a warship beeswax model creation, actually creating a model, and then lost, direct lost wax casting the model in bronze. So the purpose of this was to better understand the time, manpower, and materials needed to create ancient naval rams, which could then inform us not only about the casting and the creation process of rams, but also the economic, social, and political apparatuses of ancient navies. Uh, the project also involved a lot of little side projects, uh, like testing pine and pitch drying uh, times to see what would stick, what wouldn't stick, how much did I need to make a base. Uh, I tested beeswax melting points in various sizes against wood, uh, and then building everything for the project by hand, including the molds and copper spikes, or using uh, you know a relevant ancient tool to do so. So my RAM... Um, is of an original design. It was mostly based off um, the Eggdy three-blade design, but has various other elements of other rams like the Athlet, Colonica, and Piraeus rams, um, right? It has the design of a ram, uh, of a, a regular three-bladed waterline ram, right? It has a cow, the upper section. It has the three blades in the center, 
and it has the bottom plate at the end. All right, so this is the RAM, the, my original drawing of what I did almost three years ago now of what I wanted to create. So once I figured out what drawing I wanted to create, what RAM I wanted to create, the size of it, uh, I started to construct the bow in the reverse order. So in antiquity, you would build the warship first and then the RAM. Uh, but for my purposes, I designed my RAM first and then built the bow section based on my drawings. So my bow was based on the bow timbers found in the Athlet, Aquadroni, and Eggety Rams. So it's a freak uh, combination of timbers or timber constructions found in archaeologically attested rams. It's not so important to, I guess, the overall construction of the ram necessarily, what these timbers interlock together, but their outside shape or what they look like, their sloping, uh, et cetera, is more important. So the interior locking mechanisms don't matter as much. Uh, but the, the timbers themselves do reflect a ramming warship uh, that would have been built after 413 BCE. So once I you know, came up with the drawings, I built the bow, the false bow, um, I started to pitch the bow or cover the bow in pitch. Uh, we know that in antiquity, warships were covered in pitch based on textual evidence, and the pitch was used as a working surface not only for the beeswax, but as a way to increase the, um, the distance between the beeswax and the surface of the wood so that when shrinkage would happen during the casting process, the ram would actually fit back on the wooden bow. Uh, so these are just some pictures of the steps that I took to actually building the beeswax model. I did it in a variety of ways because, again, we are not sure how they did it necessarily in antiquity. There's some evidence based on other bronzes, but not for rams. So I did it in um, you know, beeswax sheets, slabs, uh, by hand, uh, using a, a melting method, uh, ways that I found in the ancient textual sources of how to do these things. And, of course, I was doing most of this uh, by myself, so it took a lot of time to report it. But... Surprisingly, beeswax is uh, re very resilient. As you can see in the picture of the center of the ram sitting on its head, uh, it wouldn't move, didn't crack, nothing like that. Um, once beeswax is dry, it is pretty rigid um, and can be moved easily. So once I finished the beeswax mold, unfortunately, I couldn't have it cast in one piece like they would have done it in antiquity, uh, which was very upsetting um, to me at least. Uh, but we still used, I went to a foundry in Texas, and we still use the direct lost wax casting method. The problem with the beeswax model was that it actually was too heavy, thick, and oddly shaped to safely cast in one piece. So it had to be separated into three parts, uh, the cow, the bottom plate, and the driving center. Now this, you can still get information from this casting because the driving center and everything else was still cast head down, just the three pieces had to be welded back together in those two spots. Uh, but overall, it actually didn't change that much to the casting process uh, or the process overall. Uh, sprues and everything like that were still tried to make it like an ancient ram. Um, but according to the, the, the foundry and uh, the hundreds of foundries that I called across the United States, uh, the United States does not have the casting capabilities to cast something uh, of this size anymore in a single piece. I would have to have sent it overseas to cast something. So that was that was unfortunate. But uh, in the end, we had a good looking RAM. So I know I'm kind of over time, but uh, how does the RAM compare to others? Um, the resulting cast was was pretty well off. It had no cracks, no fissures. Um, as you can see on the left, the back of my RAM compared to an archaeological RAM looks pretty good. And then to the right, uh, the three blades on the RAM I created and the Flonica RAM on the right. Um, look, they look pretty similar, but the, the differences, if you look closely, uh, are really important. They tell you things about ancient RAMs uh, that we didn't know before, right? So I'll get into that real quick, uh, just quickly. So what are some interesting things that we learned? Um, first, the spike holes. Uh, I never intended to spike my RAM to the bow. Um, I actually kind of forgot, um, but all spike holes we, based on this project must have been made in the beeswax model, um, except for in the Philonica RAM that I observed. 
has one postcast spike hole. And this means that the shipbuilder and ramcaster must have been working closely as there are also spikes in the interior wooden elements. So you don't want to cross spikes when you're building the spikes for the ram and the beeswax to cross between the wood uh, and the ram itself because you might end up spiking the ram and then spiking one of the spikes in the wood and cracking the wooden interior. So we know that the, the spikes now, the spike holes, must have been built in the beeswax model and not postcast. Uh, inscriptions, I learned a lot about how to make inscriptions. I built three inscriptions for my ram. Uh, most of them, uh, or most of the archaeologically tested inscriptions were built in the beeswax. Um, Low-level inscriptions, incised inscriptions, um, tended to, unless they were carved deeply into the wax, actually tended to go away. Um, so that's that's something that's interesting. Uh, in terms of actual ram construction or aesthetics, a lot of rams have these fin plates. I didn't build it on mine. I didn't know what they were for, their intention. Uh, but afterwards, I kind of understand that if you do have these fin plates, it actually makes it a lot easier to carry the ram or release it once it's out of its mold for casting as a holding place. And also these fin plates serve as an interlocking to the wooden element. So these would have been a secondary place where the ram would have met the wood. So when you ram something, there'd be another place where the ram would interconnect with the wood to distribute ramming forces. Uh, so I learned that about rams doing this. The fin plate tips, um, all rams or most rams have these lines on their fins. Mine does not. Again, I didn't know what they were for until this project. Um, they were, they're likely uh, for, um, for show, some of them, uh, because they have like little swords at the end. But also, they help release the fins if you make them in molds. I made one set of fins by hand, and then I, the other set of fins in a mold. And if you make the fins in a mold, they come out even. So if you have a, an archaeologically tested ram that has even fins, they probably built the ram around the core, made the fins separate in beeswax, and then stuck them to the core. And these outside fins allow you to release it easier from a mold, which I tried and I did that, uh, and it worked out perfectly. Uh, let's see. I'm uh, just, again, talking about the similar things. Um, one of the things, I guess, the striking head and frontal timbers, the density and amount of bronze at the front of a ram uh, houses actually the most weight in a ram besides the fins. Um, and the timbers at the front make the biggest difference about how your ram will be shaped at the front. If you have more torpedo-like uh, bow timbers, you will have a front that is uh, uh more like the torpedo, uh, torpedo inside. If you have a rounder bow, it will square off. And that's just the nature of building the core with the beeswax. And then trying to move forward here, um, initial conclusions and further research. Um, so based on the initial stages of the project, uh, it is safe to assume that in antiquity, a three or five or a trireme to a quinqueream sized naval ram required an average of 30 to 50 pounds of beeswax to create a model. Uh, it would probably take as many as three to four skilled craftsmen uh, to build one beeswax model, a span of four to one working days, depending on its size and complexity. So it takes a lot of manpower to actually build these things, but they can be built relatively fast if the materials are available. The process of working the beeswax likely consisted of pre-made slabs um, of wax and semi-hot wax pieces, right, worked together uh, following the additions of the fin. So the ram was probably created with the initial core first, and then the fins with the rest of the uh, decorative elements. Uh, then the use of some kind of pitch as a buffer, like I, I talked about, between the wood and beeswax to oversize and separate the model is imperative. If you don't have that extra layer, the bronze right shrinks, uh, and you won't be able to put the bronze ram back on the wooden element. But there is evidence that probably in antiquity, um, if the ram didn't fit, they either shaved down the wood to put the ram on, or they added more interior elements, maybe like a, a piece of metal or something like that, to fit the ram on if it didn't fit perfectly. Uh, and then future research may include testing the ram uh, to understand its ramming capabilities and strength. So I've been in talks with people around Texas, around Texas about you know putting this ram through different various crash tests and stuff like that, or building replica sides of replica ships, ancient ships, and uh, smashing them into one another to see what would happen and how the three blades would separate the ships and things like that.
Um, so sorry, I'm a little over time, um, but I just want to thank special thanks to Rod Fleck. Um, and if you want to find me or want to talk to me about more information, uh, that's my name, Stephen DeSashin. Uh, you can email me at Stephen at DeSashin at TAMU.edu. And then you can find me at my website. Um, and if you want to find more about Naval Rams, you can go to rpmnautical.org. So if anyone has any questions or concerns, uh, I will take them uh, as they come in. Great job, Stephen. And Thank I was you. just gonna—I was gonna throw you uh, two softballs. <laughs> start it, okay? Um, the, the one is the sponsorship of the fleet in Agati. Mm -hmm. Is that sponsorship reflected in any of the Rams recovered? And then the second one is you mentioned the popularity of these amazing items. Uh, does mm -hmm. that popularity continue forward to today in artwork and materials? So yes, the, there are inscriptions on the Rams, especially, uh, of course, the Latin Rams talk about the Quaestor or Quaestor, who is the Roman official who um, would, I guess, be in charge of dulling out this money for um, these Rams, right? So it says uh, so-and-so, uh, you know, ex Quaestor, son of so-and-so, approved this ram on the ram itself. Um, so we do have evidence of the person who is in charge of providing the funds for this ram. Uh, and then to your second question, do we see rams today? Uh, yes, we see um, variations of three-bladed waterline rams in modern uh, buildings. We see them at the National Museum, Maritime Museum in London. There are two triremes on top of the museum that have three bladed waterline rams. Um, in New York City, the the um, was it the monument to the main, I believe. There is a ship with a three bladed waterline ram. Um, I think in in the Northeast there is a rostral column to Columbus that has three bladed waterline rams on it. Um, a lot of these things we see rams come out in. Um, Victorian and neoclassical architecture. And we see a lot of three bladed waterline rams uh, come out, especially in Italy during the fascist period uh, and Benedetto Mussolini. So when you go to Italy and you see modern reconstructions of three bladed waterline rams, they're probably from the fascist regime, which is interesting. Hope that answers the question. It did. It did. And now if others might have some questions here as we go a little bit over time. Uh, but if Stephen's willing to do so, we'll uh, open up. If there's any other anyone else that's been watching that would like to ask a question, yeah, Curry, I, uh, yeah. Hmm? thank you. Um, yes, yeah, Stephen, I have a question for you. Thank you so much for this talk. It was really fascinating. Um, you went over a little bit, kind of speedily, the mm -hmm. differences between your RAM and. Mm -hmm the ancient rams and i was wondering what the most surprising difference was to you what was something that while you were casting um kind of changed maybe your interpretation of how rams were made mm -hmm. i think the, the 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 greatest thing that i learned was the the process of which it was likely done um and what i mean by that is that when you build the ship the first part the likely likely the first part built for a ram is the central core, right? And this um, is reflected in all rams if you see their interior, is that the ram directly shows the interior timbers of the warship it was placed on, right? So when you build the beeswax model, you're building it directly on the surface. So you can see the timbers for which it was once placed on. Um, and these timbers reflect the shape of the, the ram shape for which you're going to make. So if I built the timbers differently, or if I gave them a different turn, it would have been more difficult to give the, the ram a different front style or it would have been sharper, et cetera. So the way in which the, the shipbuilder actually builds the forward timbers, whether it's rounder or sharper, actually will affect the way in which the ram is also built, right? So you can't just be like, oh, all trireme rams have this around or square front because trireme bows could be you know a little bit shorter a little bit wider and that re is reflected in each ram built so rams are a direct reflection of the warship they are built on even more so than we thought they were i think that that's that's the most important part hi 
have a question. Um, mm -hmm. What got you started down the path of history and archaeology to begin with? Great question. Um, um, I did my undergrad at Stockton University in New Jersey. Um, and I had, uh, when I, tra I transferred there as a sophomore from Rowan University, and I wanted to do, I guess, I wanted to do Soviet history. Uh, but when I transferred to Stockton University, you had to take four undergraduate semesters of a language. And when I transferred, the only class open was ancient Greek language. Uh, so I had no choice because if I wanted to graduate on time, I had to take a language. So I took ancient Greek language and I kind of fell in love with ancient Greece um, through that class. So I decided to take more and more classes. Um, and then when I finished that degree, uh, I end up reading The Age of Titans, uh, the book by William M. Murray, the guy who studies ancient naval rams and naval warfare. Um, and I did my master's with him. Um, and he uh, really you know, showed me the way. And I've been obsessed with naval rams uh, and naval warfare, just like him, uh, ever since I took classes with him. And I've been working with him ever since. Uh, so that's that's kind of how I got into it. Great question. Thank you. It's Thank you. Uh, really exciting to see your excitement about this. It's <laughs> fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. With that, if there's no other questions, uh, we'll let we'll let everybody have their Saturday morning back. I hope you found this enjoyable. I, I know I was. I'm always excited, especially around the summer season when Stephen's abroad, because he'll post on his social media uh, accounts pictures or on the one for the research organization, Stephen. And that, if you could say that one again, because folks might want to follow those on social media sites where you mm -hmm. post, where those posts get put up as well. Yeah, so you can. I work for uh, RPM Nautical Foundation. So if you want to follow RPM Nautical Foundation on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, or Instagram. I do, when I'm out there working for them in Sicily, I will post updates for them um, when we are allowed to post updates and I find we find things interesting. Um, but yeah, you can also follow me um, on Twitter, Instagram, or things like that. My name, everything is just under my name, Stephen DeSachin, and I just post about Naval Ram things all day, as Rod says. Uh, well, if you like that, then you'll, you'll definitely like following me. <laughs> there you go. Okay, with that, folks, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, this has been a great opportunity for us. And I think, Stephen, you're the one that gets to click us off. So take care. Right. And I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.